Well, I'm really grateful to the Institute for, for inviting me to, to be here and to, to share my experiences with you, but I'm really uh, particularly grateful to you all for coming out on such a, such a wonderful evening, isn't it? <laughs> so I suppose the, the reason why I was asked to, to speak tonight is really because of the issues that I've been preoccupied with for, for quite some time, the issue particularly around urbanization and environmental health being two of the key areas. And so perhaps over the next, give or take, 25 to 30 minutes, I'm going to ask that you come along on a journey with me to really think and consider the ways in which design, development, and disease are working together as critical and interdependent parts, elements of our planet's future. And I would say, first and foremost, in order to do this, in order to really, really do this over the next, let's say, half an hour, it's really going to be important to just, just for a while anyway, suspend everything we know or everything we think we know about the way that these three areas work together. And I suppose one way of doing that is perhaps to ask you to, to consider, well, reframing and repositioning the issue. Now that's really important because we, we have enough examples throughout history that when we reposition a topic and a theme, it really helps expose the issue in a different light. And that's really at the crux of what I'm, I'm, I'm hoping to share with you this evening. So what we, if I'm in your position when I go to events like these, I'm always very curious to know, well, well who is the person up there? You know, what, why does this mean as much to him or her? You know, what is it that he or she brings to the table? And despite the John's introduction, I would ask you to really think about, well, well, who am I? And I'm raising the question on your behalf. Who am I? Well, for those of you, I, I know the visibility might be a bit difficult back there, but for those of you in the front row, if you look very closely, you'll see I'm not that guy. <laughs> in fact, 150 pounds and over 30 years later, I want to believe in my heart of hearts, I'll always be this guy. Um, so a little bit about me is, John mentioned, I'm, I'm from Jamaica, a country of about 2.5 million, known for more, more than Usain Bolt and Bob Marley, I assure you. And while the, the house in the, in the center of the picture is a photograph from, from Kingston, is not my family home, it very well easily could have been. You see, I. I was born into a household of eight within an environment, a physical environment that was perhaps more suitable for four. And by the age of 14, my dad developed a rodent-borne uh, disease, which was directly attributed to poor living conditions. And I guess that disease, well, ultimately gave him a blood clot, which, which left him paralyzed, immobile, for seven years until his passing. And one of the very vivid memories that re remain with me to this day is the fact that the, the local church donated a wheelchair uh, for, for him to, to use. And essentially that wheelchair was rendered inoperable by the simple fact that it could not be moved through from one room to the other. The doorways weren't wide enough. And I guess it wasn't until years later that I was forced to reflect on what this meant, this challenge. And the fact is, in that experience, and it was really only until years later that I was able to, to consider it in this way, that housing, poor, unsuitable housing, was both responsible for my dad's illness, in terms of the disease, and ultimately, to some extent, his, his passing, but also clearly incapable of meeting his care needs. So the inability to 
prevent as well as to treat. And that's a theme I'll, I'll clearly be returning to, to later on. So then it comes to the issue, well, well, who is this guy? And some of you, I'm sure, already know. He's Fritjof Capra. Um, some consider him to be a kind of father of systems thinking. But what Capra asks us to, to do is to consider the world. Well, first of all, to really think about the world differently in terms of a completely different paradigm moving away from the world as we tend to see it, as a machine, a sort of kit of parts working side by side, somewhat independent, and consider the world as a kind of more, much more of a living system, one which works interdependently with elements working together, almost indistinguishable. And again, this notions of system thinking once I was introduced to this almost, well, actually well over a decade ago, really began to, 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 to really resonate with me. Now as we, we understand this concept and we move outwards, it's important tonight that we, through the lens of systems thinking, begin to think about the world as we know it today. And there are a few things we know about the world in terms of what's happening. Is one, there are more of us that are inhabiting spaces. And the truth is the world is urbanizing, some would say, as the jury's out on this, faster than it ever has before. There is evidence which suggests that it's beginning to slow in, in some areas. But nonetheless, disproportionately we see that where urban growth is really exploding, it tends to be in those regions with very limited and scarce resources. When you compare that to developed regions, industrialized nations, you can see for yourself, that growth is marginal, yes? So this added strain on the most vulnerable regions, most vulnerable part of the world, are, are bound to have some type of impact. And if we look at this comparison through a geographic lens, we can see, or rather it perhaps confirms what we've long suspected, that the real explosion is happening in Asia, right? Perhaps China and India are responsible for, uh, for a lot of that growth, but we also see that disproportionately that growth is also happening in Africa in terms of urbanization and what that's, what that's doing. And it's something that it's important for us to, to consider because we essentially share the planet with over two and a half billion people in, 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 in the region of Asia alone. So as we think about our, our planet as a kind of finite space and the resources that are within that space, well, it's a real no-brainer to consider that over time, over a short period of time, areas or issues rather, such as water, such as health, such as land or where we live, the spaces that we'll inhabit, will become, already is, increasingly scarce. That's not surprising. I don't think I'm sharing anything particularly new. However, to continue to view these elements as somewhat independent of each other is to examine a 21st century challenge through a 19th century lens, I would argue. And as we see the population explode, in 2013 we're looking at about, give or take, 7 billion. Two over the next 40 years, a world in which 9 billion of us will have to kind of coexist. It's not surprising that these resources are even going to be more limited. You know, when we think about where it is that we're all living and, and moving to, I'm not quite sure about the, the conditions in, in Minneapolis where this is concerned, but when I think about colleagues of mine who are living in either Manhattan or, or London, a lot of them are seeking with their families to kind of move out, right? To move out to neighboring Long Island or New Jersey or in London. Some will move to neighboring uh, parts of Essex or 
or, or places nearby where perhaps real estate is, is less expensive, perhaps there's more land space. And that tends to be a kind of developed world uh, mentality, I would argue, right? The question for you tonight is, what's happening in Asia? What's happening in parts of Africa? In the developing world, where are people moving to? Do we believe that they are, I don't know, moving to the picturesque prairies of Bangladesh, which is the image that you're seeing up, up, up top? Do we believe that there are many who are moving with their families to, I don't know, the overwhelmingly beautiful desert oasis in Mali? I mean, these kind of picturesque environments to kind of retreat? Well, no. No, not at all. In fact, where we see the movement occurring is really into very densely populated environment and diverse environment like, like Dhaka, which is the image on the left, in Bangladesh, or the lively landscapes of Lagos, as we see on the image on the right. The truth is these are cities with resources. And in the developing world, people gravitate to resources, just like us, in search of opportunities. And these cities are swelling, they're growing, there are certainly much more of them that will emerge over the next uh, 20 to 50 years. And this is something I'd like us to, to consider, certainly over the next few minutes and, and, and after this presentation. As we think about this movement, the truth is each year about 60 million people are moving into cities. Not individuals who are being born into these cities, but people in search of opportunities. As I said, resources, or after jobs, really formal or informal, 60 million. And of that number, as many as 10%, in fact, some would argue in excess of 10%, are moving, so that's about 6 million, moving directly into slums, shanty towns, informal settlements, whatever we'd like to call it, favelas, barrios. Yes? Conditions, environments in which overcrowding is rife. Perhaps there is the threat, the constant threat of forced eviction, perhaps, where the structures, place they call home, couldn't withstand a small earthquake or tremor or a cyclone, a hurricane. Or where, to be quite blunt, there isn't a decent place to defecate. These are the realities for, for so many millions around the world. And it's so important that as I ask you to consider the world through a kind of urban lens, I would like you to just switch gears slightly to consider the same world through a global health lens, if that's possible. And so when you think about health, particularly for the most vulnerable people on the planet, what is it that comes to mind? What is it? Is it the fact that five major diseases are known to be responsible for 90% of all deaths from infectious diseases? Does that come to mind? Or is it that if you're born in a country like Uganda today, you are 800 times more likely to die from respiratory diseases than if you're born in a country like the United States? today? Or is it that if you're a child living among the poorest people on the planet, the poorest of the poor, there's a 60% chance you'll die from infectious disease? I mean, this is a state of health. I juxtapose these two images to really reinforce the fact that, well, there, there are some issues that we know. We know that overcrowding contributes or exacerbates the risk of diseases like TB, you know, a centuries-old disease, tuberculosis, that kills upwards of a million and a half each year. We know that things like poor drainage and, and um, uh, unsuitable waste management uh, contributes to diarrhea-related illnesses, which kills almost two million each year. We also know that poorly ventilated spaces contribute to indoor air pollution, which again kills upwards of a million and a half each year. It's important to really recognize this kind of juxtaposition as a reminder that the health burden 
is by no means spread equally, nor should it be, but, but nonetheless it needs to be a reminder. Now, we, we need to really consider, and I'm asking you to consider or really reflect on the current state of things. When we think about our health system globally, well, what are the two areas that come to mind? Well, we know overwhelmingly it's a treatment-based paradigm, one in which there is a lot of investment, uh, work, effort being placed on uh, infrastructure. I'm aware that there are many other components uh, in terms of health systems, but infrastructure is a dominant part, particularly in development, in which we believe that building more health facilities will provide an improvement to overall health for those who need it most. And I'm sure you're, you're quite aware of the limitation of that model. A quick example is in a country like India, we know that you know, per 100,000 population, that is for, for, for each group of 100,000 people, we know that there are a little over 150 beds, hospital beds available per 100,000. Can we actually build enough health facilities to meet that need? In the rural India, it's, it's much less. It's probably closer to about nine beds per 100,000. And if I were to try to bring that closer to home, right here in the United States, the issue of what's known as HAIs, hospital acquired infections, it's, it's a known challenge. In fact, more specifically, about 100,000 people are infected with HAIs in the United States alone. That means they've entered the hospital for for one reason, for one issue, and they've left those who do leave with another. As much as 20,000 die each year in this country alone. That's equivalent, by the way, to about a 747 crashing and killing all its passengers every single week. That's a massive number, and I can share with you tonight that in the developing world, those figures are far higher. The other side of the equation is a preventative model. My experience speaking with colleagues in the field of, let's say, malaria, and I certainly am one, and I'm sure um, some of you have, who have taken your malaria meds when you have, when you have traveled, and I, I did that two weeks ago in, in Cameroon. Well, we know that despite the billions that are spent each year on, ne I would say, necessary research uh, for anti-malarials, pretty much these medications run a seven-year lifespan before resistance uh, is built up. So I ask you to consider, again, this paradigm and whether or not we should remain exclusively with these two models or whether or not there is room to adopt a more integrated approach, one in which, particularly for the most vulnerable people on our planet, housing can form part of the equation. I take that even a step further. For the most vulnerable people on our planet, housing and health should be indistinguishable. Indistinguishable. You know, this concept, indistinguishable concept, it's been around for a while. In fact, the Greeks had something to, to say about this. And you, you know the Greeks. I mean, they're good at putting stuff like this together. But the centuries-old mythological figure on the, on the right is what many of you know, the chimera, or the chimera, however you want to pronounce it. Right? And the notion there and the analogy I'm trying to bring to this is, is really much in the same way that the chimera could not, could not, is not, identified by each of the animals that they tend to represent, it's a goat, it's a lion, it's a dragon, it's a snake. No, it's none of those or it's all of those. The analogy we really do try to make is that for the poorest, most vulnerable individuals on our planet, housing and health needs to be indistinguishable. At the end of the day, this is about economics, isn't it? This is about getting to the root causes. And we know that unfortunately, it is the poorest countries, the least developed countries, lowest economies as well as the, the middle income economies that are bearing the brunt. 
spending is up, certainly upwards of 10% of their GDP on health. Is that a sustainable model? Is there space, room, to encourage them to think systemically about the issues? The issue being an opportunity to invest in housing to achieve desired health outcomes, therefore freeing up the budget for additional basic service expenditures. Is this a possibility? And at the same time, you know, we're, we're comforted by, by messages such as that of John Reckford from Habitat CEO of Habitat for Humanity, who shared a, a year ago that in fact, it's really about getting at the root cause, providing suitable living conditions, because you can build all the schools you want. If that young girl or that young boy does not have a decent place to live that protects him or her for the most dreaded diseases that they face in their community, then the issue of education, livelihood, is almost irrelevant because so many, and that is a sad truth, do not make it. Do not make it. You know, about three years ago, researchers at, at Oxford University worked with the UN Development Program to expand upon the HDI, the Human Development Index. And for the first time, what, was, what emerged was the MPI, Multi-Poverty Dimensional Index, which aimed to extract from the known HDI specific components. They began to highlight the fact that these three deprivations living conditions, living standards, health and education were vital for reversing the cycles of poverty. And for the first time, and we were really encouraged by this, we began to look at components of the home, essentially. And they made it very clear that by tackling these core elements can be a vital part of improving the lives of millions around the world. So against all this, I started Archive Global back in 2006 because I believed, I saw the evidence, to some extent I lived the experience, that where people call home and the health risks they face are very much interdependent. And much, as I shared with you, the the experience with my dad, we believe that as an organization, we should invest in preventative strategies to address disease, to combat and fight disease. In order to think systemically, though, we also, we also had to look at a treatment-based approach, one in which we're improving living conditions to ensure that we're creating a suitable uh, care environment for those already ill. And so, as an organization, we work to empower citizens, communities, sometimes countries, to really work from the bottom up. It's a bit of a buzzword, but it's true, from the bottom up. And so the image below really does give a snapshot of our work in Haiti, a country like Haiti, where we're working with residents to discuss have discussions about how design could actually play a role in combating a dreaded disease like TB, tuberculosis. In Haiti, TB is the, certainly in Haiti, the highest uh, in the entire region. It's the highest prevalence rate, about 300 per 100,000. When you compare that to the United States, which is about four per 100,000. The figure above, though, at the same time, simultaneously, we are working with community groups. In Haiti below, in London above, city of London, not a lot of people are aware. And we were asked to, to, to be quite delicate in terms of how we share that information. But what is quite well known at this point is that London, in London there is a 30 year, TB is at a 30 year high. Again, a respiratory illness. We work with residents, vulnerable residents, to discuss the way in which living conditions affect the risk associated with TB transmission there. And that's, 
That's a practice, that's a process that continues to this day. I'll share with you with the time remaining two quick examples of our work and how we put it into action. So you all remember it was, uh, was over three years ago that the devastating earthquake hit, hit Haiti, killing almost 300,000 people, making over a million homeless. We were interested in working in Haiti and since 2009, yet the earthquake certainly exacerbated an already dire issue. Well, we wanted to consider ways in which we could draw attention to the role of improving or building new houses as a key means, a key means of improving the health of local Haitians. So we launched with the help of the UN Special Envoy and a senior representative from the WHO, an international campaign called Kai Santin and Haiti, Creole for Housing and Health in Haiti. We drew about 1,600 participants from around the world to consider ways in which design could be used as a key strategy for combating deadly diseases like TB. We got the assistance and involvement of about 30 internationally respected uh, leaders to act as judges, to spend countless hours sifting through the projects to look at what worked and perhaps what didn't or what could be improved upon. We brought a number of them to London and we discussed. And we ultimately chose what we believe to be some of the strongest entries. Now these were put through quite a rigorous process. One in which we looked at about 40 different criteria, everything from cost to applicability, use of local materials, important criteria that we believe were key for a sustainable project. And the five images showed the five that were shortlisted because essentially we were very keen to test, to apply, and to understand and learn from what works or to what extent did it work. And that's something that we, we believe in. That project continues and we're happy to report that despite, well, lack of many resources in Haiti, we, we, we continue. That's something that we're, we're certainly committed to. Uh, the, the image does show a snapshot of our process where we walk through the experience of design and thinking about the issue. I, what I'm not showing you here is the kind of process when we go back to the community and discuss the design ideas with them to have the community vet and ensure that it's locally acceptable. Then building a kind of full-scale mock-up before then completing the, the project on site. That's a process that we are certainly committed to. Well, Haiti is a kind of special case in that we were encouraged by the kind of partnership that we were able to foster. Because in this case, we committed to building an additional 20 homes in the country. We're, we're excited about that. Still a drop in the ocean, to be honest, in terms of the, the overall need. But then what we took a decision to do is to work with our partners to develop a more holistic integrated community and the image here just begins to show it's a I, I purposefully wanted to to bring a an image from the office which show the kind of development ideas we had a lot more sort of markups but but nonetheless it's it's a process where we begin to think with the community about ways in which an entire parcel of land could be developed it was donated by the government and we have a number of partners that are working with us including partners based right here in the United States we're working to develop, and that's what the images begin to show. A, this is Rod Cadman, one of our volunteers, working on site, developing and training locals to, to build a, a community water access point. The intention is to also develop an agricultural project with the help of an organization called Zamni Agricole, an offshoot of uh, Paul Farmer's organization. We're also keen to build a, a vocational facility, which will provide necessary training and job skills to, to locals. And our partner has come on board because they recognize and the community certainly needs, uh, uh, certainly needs a health facility as well. So it's an overall integrated uh, project. Now the issue of, of research and how it underpins our work 
should be if it hasn't already been clear. I spent a little over a year working at University College London with fellow my colleagues, microbiologists, environmental engineers, considering simple truths like this, the role of humidity in affecting the transmission risk associated with TB or diseases like TB. This is something, again, this kind of evidence exists. Now we should ask ourselves, why isn't it being deployed, being utilized in a way that benefits those who need it most? Just jumping very quickly to the other side, the other side of the pond, so to speak, uh, in, in Cameroon, right? A country of about 16 million, 100% of the population are at risk to malaria. In fact, about 40% of all deaths by children under five in Cameroon are attributed to malaria alone. Across the African continent, or I should say globally, 90% of all deaths from malaria occur in Africa alone. And at the same time, we know that in cities like Yaoundé, the country's capital, as much as 80% of settlements are actually informal, 80%. So for an organization like Archive, we saw very clearly there was a dual burden dual burden of disease, burden of poor housing conditions. We wanted to set out the challenge, a challenge similar to what we set out for Haiti, where we asked a global audience with the support from the CDC right here in the United States to consider ways in which design could actually play a role in combating malaria. Right? And again, some of you may ask the question, well, well how are the two related? Well, what we know and what the evidence has told us for quite some time is that there are associations between urban expansion and certainly the breeding sites and increased uh, recognition that breeding sites are associated with, with environmental conditions, as well as housing. The things that we take for granted very often in the West, like screens, you know, someone says, you know, something so, so simple, but it, it's proven to be effective. And that is something that is hugely overlooked. The images here begin to show some of the examples that were, were submitted. Now, unlike the Haiti project, where we did completely new build construction, in Cameroon, we were committed to improvement strategies rather than new build. As an organization, going forward, we are keen to focus our efforts and our energies around three main areas, from left to right, around influencing policy. We were invited in 2010 by the European Centre for Disease Control to help draft a policy on urban TB in Europe. Image in the middle is a photo of our bioclimatic chamber used at uh, UCL to really test materials and to simulate environmental conditions under which they could perform. And then the kind of bricks and mortar, kind of like what I described in Haiti and Cameroon, where we will continue to build. That's an essential part of what we will continue to deploy. In terms of program areas, well, sanitation is going to continue to, to be part of our work. It does not exist on its own in the way that some believe that it should be. We believe that sanitation needs to be developed, designed, modified in the context of, of the home or understanding the way in which living conditions is associated with it. And then cooking, the way we cook, where we cook, you know, that needs to be a focus area for our organization. And then the overlooked issues, diseases like Chagas that kills about 50,000 each year, that's really overlooked. These are areas that our organization are very keen to, to explore. So what's next? Well, for us, it's about what we call disrupting, right? It's about the, how we integrate technology. We're quite excited about that because our team in, in London and New York are working on this right now, a platform that will in essence allow us to really continue to innovate, but innovate in such a way that will, what we believe will democratize development, allow members of the public to become directly engaged with our mission, to actually get involved in managing and designing their own projects based on the mission and the evidence that we're able to share. That's so important for us. So I draw, as I draw this to a conclusion, I want you to, to consider something that we were introduced to uh, a few years ago. I remember reading through the development magazine published by DFID, the UK Department for International Development. I guess that's more similar to, to USAID. 
you know, in which it was argued, well, it's not rocket science, right? It's medical science. You get medicines, people are sick, and they'll get better. Now, in all fairness to Diffid, what they were really trying to highlight here were, was the barrier, inherent barrier in the supply chain model and the importance of getting medicines to people who needed it most. And that's something that we believe in. However, you see, we don't believe it's just medical science. As an organization, we believe, we believe, we continue to believe, we believe then and we certainly believe now that among the poorest people on our planet, housing should be, can be, but should be a central strategy for improving health. Well, I just want to share with you one more thing. Just picture for a second. A woman by the name of Quincy, who lives in South Africa, where 100,000 people die each year from tuberculosis alone. Quincy and her family lives in a one-room house with too much indoor moisture and too little ventilation. Well, as an organization, we're keen to use simple, low-cost, low-tech strategies such as this. Charcoal. Now, for many of you, it's a staple part of barbecues, perhaps July 4th. But for Archive, a biodegradable alternative means a cheap building material that greatly reduces indoor moisture therefore works to combat diseases like TB and therefore save lives. Thank you very much.